Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Jacobson. I'm president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. I'm very pleased to be your moderator for uh, this segment of Business and Industry Day focusing on technology and setting a business roadmap to achieving the Paris Agreement goals. This panel will look at the role of technology and the suite of energy solutions that will be needed to deploy and help countries meet their mitigation and adaptation goals as outlined in the NDCs. I'm especially pleased that the Business Council for Sustainable Energy has organized this event with some outstanding partner organizations. And the way that we're gonna run this segment is we will have two mini panels. The first panel will kind of set the stage at the highest level about the role of technology in terms of meeting mitigation and adaptation and resiliency goals. The second panel will feature those closer to implementation, the companies and industries that are putting the technologies in the ground and helping customers at a very local level. So we'll have a nice mix of big picture views, what are the current trends, what are the current challenges, how are the broad set of clean energy technologies working today, what are the visions for the future, and then we'll have a very practical discussion about uh, different case studies and projects and uh, new innovations in the marketplace. The Business Council for Sustainable Energy is a trade association. We are based in the United States, and we're very proud to be celebrating our 25th anniversary this year, and probably our 22nd anniversary is participating in the climate change negotiation process. The council represents a very broad set of industry sectors, energy efficiency, both in the supply side and demand side, the broad portfolio of renewable energy technologies, and the natural gas industries. Looking at North America, or more specifically, the United States, we have seen that energy efficiency, natural gas, and renewable energy are really the growth sectors of our energy economy. And because of that, we were very pleased to say that we are at a 25-year low in the United States in terms of our overall greenhouse gas emissions, and the power sector and energy efficiency, renewable energy, and natural gas have been large contributors to that success. We clearly have much more work to be done, and a key theme that the Council brings to COP23 is this idea of powering enhanced ambition, and we are laser focused on what we can do in this time period between now and 2020 to increase the ambition levels and then hopefully as we see progress there we will see more NDCs uh, being codified that are higher than where they started out. We certainly seek that in the United States and feel firmly that we can achieve what we set out to accomplish under Paris because businesses, cities, states, and communities are coming together and see the significant benefits to their economy, to job creation, to the environment, to resiliency from moving forward with cleaner and low carbon energy solutions. So the Council is very pleased to be at COP23. We uh, are honored to be part of the, the bingo segment of the official side events of COP23. And now I'd like to introduce some of our co-hosts, and each one of them will have an opportunity to share some of their views about how they're seeing uh, COP23 and the issues of importance for their sectors. What I'd like to do is introduce each one of them, and then they'll come, I'll, I'll introduce all of them at once, and then each one of them will come up and make some opening comments for us. Uh, Laura Van Way McCrory, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives for the Alliance to Save Energy, will be our first speaker. Then she'll be followed by Elizabeth Beardsley, Senior Policy Counsel for the U.S. Green Building Council. And then we will be joined uh, via video uh, by Clay Nessler, Vice President of Global Sustainability and Industry Initiatives for Johnson Controls. But we have in person uh, Dr. Anda Guerin, Global Energy and Sustainable Energy Policy Manager for Johnson Controls. And then we will hear from Ben Gruitt, Director of Sustainability and Advanced Bioproducts from the Corn Refiners Association. Again, this event is being put together by the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, the Alliance to Save Energy, and the U.S. Green Building Council and the Corn Refiners Association. So with that, Laura.
Thank you, Lisa. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be able to bring the perspective of an organization that has focused for 40 years on the importance of collaboration between the private sector and the public sector to promote energy efficiency. So the Alliance to Save Energy is a nonprofit organization. We're based in the United States. We're a co coalition of uh, business and government leaders, as well as environmental advocates, advocates and other NGOs. And we were founded in 1977 by two US senators who uh, wanted to make sure that there was an organization that was nonpartisan, that was public, private, and that would focus on education and outreach and research for energy efficiency, as well as on advocating for strong energy efficiency policy in the US, as well as internationally. Um, over the last few years, we have really focused increasingly on framing our energy, energy efficiency activities and our advocacy on a goal of improving energy productivity, so getting more economic output for every unit of energy that we use. Um, our board of directors in, is itself a public-private partnership. It includes a whole slate of business executives, as well as about 15 honorary board members who are members of the US Congress. So from both chambers, the, U the Senate and the House of Representatives, and both Democrats and Republicans. And we have about 30, um, uh, 30 associate member companies and organizations, and you can see a lot of them here. Um, and the thing that we have found, working with this terrific group of partners, and this is the main point that I want to make in my presentation today, is that collaboration between private and public sectors is critical for and extremely effective for setting ambitious goals, um, setting them together for improving energy efficiency and energy productivity, for publicizing those goals, and then for demonstrating that these goals are achievable. Um, I'm sure this is a graph that you've seen before. I'm showing it because it's one that has given us new motivation at the Alliance for all the work that we do in the United States and internationally. What it shows that uh, is that even if all of the energy-related components of the NDCs are achieved, we need to go much farther in terms of clean energy investment to stay within the two-degree scenario. And what the International Energy Agency estimates is that almost half of these additional emissions reductions will need to come from energy efficiency. But as, criti as critical as energy efficiency is for climate mitigation, the Alliance relies on its economic benefits in order to sell energy efficiency. That's a key message that resonates across the political spectrum, across the social spectrum. And we have a lot to say about the economic benefits. Um, energy efficiency is clearly the, the United States' greatest energy resource. The energy that we save every year as a result of all of the energy efficiency policies and programs that have been put into place since 1973 is more energy than we get from any single energy source, including oil. And if we tried to run today's economy without all those energy efficiency improvements, we would need 50% more energy than we use now. Um, these efficiency improvements save the US $800 billion a year and have reduced, incidentally, our CO2 emissions by 7% compared to a 2010 baseline. So the result of these many years of energy efficiency policies and programs, um, building codes uh, and appliance standards, among others, in addition to voluntary programs like Energy Star and Better Buildings Challenge, as well as private sector investments in energy efficiency mean that the US has dramatically increased our energy productivity. Over the last few decades, our GDP has increased by almost 150%. Um, at the same time, our annual energy consumption has only gone up about a seventh of that amount, so that between 1980 and, 19, and 2014, we've actually doubled our, our national energy productivity. And in 2011, um, the Alliance convened a commission based uh, consisting of both public and private sector leaders to work together to set an ambitious goal of doubling our energy productivity again by 2030. So moving that blue business as usual line up to the red line, which shows 100% growth in energy productivity by 2030. And the commission worked together to outline policies and investments needed to get us there. And we've used this collaboration and this goal as a call to action to promote and defend energy efficiency policies in the United States. If you see the dotted line that shows that some progress was made that was recalculated in 2016, and so the business as usual line has moved up. 
Um, so one thing that makes this effort so effective in the U.S. is that that commission was able to quantify and to articulate the economic benefits of doubling U.S. energy productivity in terms of monetary savings, in terms of increased energy security in the form of reduced energy imports, and also increased prosperity through um, job growth and GDP growth. So focusing on these kind of concrete outcomes has been really effective for communicating the economic benefits of energy efficiency to policymakers in the US and our other countries and for promoting increased investment in energy efficiency. Um, recent reports by the US Department of Energy have confirmed the importance of energy efficiency in our jobs market, estimating that more than a third of the US energy workforce is involved with energy efficiency sector, manufacturing installation sales of energy efficiency equipment, and that these types of jobs are growing. Um, so we see progress, but there are also many areas where we see a need for increased public and private sector collaboration to help advance energy efficiency and energy pro productivity, and I'll just mention a couple of those. One of those is um, reaching a new level of efficiency in buildings. And so the Alliance to Save Energy, we launched in 2015 a systems efficiency initiative to support efforts that are going on in the industry to try to improve building energy efficiency by focusing on whole building systems and not just individual components. This, we're looking at um, not just building systems within buildings like lighting and HVAC systems, but we look outside buildings too to look for systems level efficiency opportunities uh, such as district energy systems, uh, combined heat and power, and building to grid integration. So the goal of this initiative uh, is to identify areas for large potential savings, but also to develop specific recommendations for how to get there. And we are led by a steering committee that um, has more than 50 company representatives, utilities, government agencies, and research organizations. And we've produced two reports that are both available online, the first one in 2015 called Greater Than the Sum of Its Parts, and the second one um, is a systems efficiency blueprint that contains 84 separate recommendations for different actors from all the way up from US Congress down to architects on how to move the market in that direction. Another area ripe for um, collaboration is transportation. In the US, transportation sector has been identified as the energy end use in the country uh, with the greatest efficiency gain potential. It's also our largest consumer of fossil fuels, and so those points combined with the fact that transportation is just on the cusp of such a transformation um, with the increased viability of alternative fuels, electrification, automation, and shared mobility. So this, this area offers enormous opportunities to improve energy efficiency, but it's complicated and it really needs collaboration with public and private sectors. So we just three weeks ago launched a new initiative um, with representatives from cars and equipment manufacturers, city and state policymakers, utilities and regulators, and others, and set, uh, had a commission meeting that set a 50 by 50 goal, which is a 50 goal for 50% reduction in energy use in the U.S. transportation sector by 2050, relative to 2016. Um, we've, we're just getting started with our technical committees working on market assessments and recommendations, so if you come back in a year, we can report on how that's going. Um, just a couple more things. In terms of demonstrating what's possible, we continue to encourage private sector leadership uh, improving energy productivity. Uh, we're working with the Climate Group on the EP100 Corporate Commitment Platform, which encourages influential companies around the world to pledge to double their own energy productivity within 25 years, starting with a baseline as early as 2005. We have 12 companies that have currently joined and a whole bunch of other ones in the pipeline. Would be delighted to talk to any other interested companies. And I'll just end with a note about an upcoming opportunity to continue these types of discussions, the Alliance's annual International Energy Efficiency Conference, EE Global. This year we're gonna hold it in Copenhagen in May uh, in coordination with the Clean Energy Ministerial and we're co-hosted by the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency and the Danish government. Um, so you can find that online or reach out to me if you're interested in knowing more. That's it. Thank you, Laura, that was great. It's great to hear about the gains in energy productivity and how that um, private-public collaboration at the national scale has been so critical in the US. I'm gonna take a little look into um, some of the private sector collaboration with cities and states, the subnational sector in the US, um, particularly around buildings. So I'm from the US Green Building Council. You may know us best for the LEED rating system 
but we are really a mission-based organization. We have an increasing uh, level of engagement around the world and LEAD is now in over 170 countries. Um, in fact, over half of our new projects are coming from outside the United States. So we're excited about that. Um, and we are supporting climate action through our network, collaboration, um, our education platform, and other resources and policy advocacy as well. So we actually do a lot behind the scenes. All right, <laughs> I was warned. <laughs> Is it supposed to aim somewhere? Oh, there we go. Oops, now I went too far. Can I go back? Is it play back? Um, so just taking a look at the, the cities, uh, okay, <laughs> that's right, um, cities in the U.S., cities and states are responding to the challenge of climate, and we saw this actually in the run-up to Paris with the compact of mayors and really increasing um, over the last two years, and even as the um, national government has taken a new stand that's a little different. Um, cities and states are really redoubling their efforts. Um, and with those, that includes commitments to greenhouse gas emission targets and also to taking actions to, um, to achieve those. All right. There we go. And uh, in this slide, we see that some number of cities have made a commitment, and that's because it's actually changing every day. So. I know we're upwards of 150 cities. Um, I think over 70% of the country's GDP is already represented by climate commitments. So we want to um, do a lot to support the cities and using their authorities, which are quite important in the US. And uh, in particular, we're focused on buildings and supporting building policy. Buildings are really essential um, about 30% of global energy uh, related carbon emissions. Um, built, we're, we know globally that the building energy intensity is improving, but the amount of total energy is still increasing because of development around the globe, increasing uh, square footage per person, increased cooling. So that's, uh, that's important. In the US, we have Total building energy use is flat, even though we have new construction, so that goes to that increase in energy productivity, which is great, but we know we need to do better. Um, so it's been projected that we need to decrease 80% uh, of energy intensity in buildings by 2050 to attain the under two target. But they're also a feasible solution. Um, buildings have been long recognized as among the least cost approaches to um, achieving significant greenhouse gas reduction. We have technology, we have the know-how. So um, more than 270 billion could be invested in existing U.S. building retrofits and to achieve um, savings of over a trillion. These data points have been out there. Um, what we need to do is work together, public and private sectors, to make it actually happen. And so these new partnerships are really helping to drive that change. Um, we have collaborations like the City Energy Project, where um, the Institute for Market Transformation and NRDC have been able to um, work closely with cities and place staff to work on building benchmarking policies, and that's been really transformational. We have the Building Efficiency Accelerator, which is a global program with some U.S. city participation and a lot of resources coming out of that that are available to anyone. Um, we have our Amplify program that we're involved in with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and that is working to have a private sector-led project in cities at a city scale, so working with the city but not putting the responsibility with the city government, which already has uh, so much going on, but to let the private sector work together to drive efficiency, to drive retrofits, to do business-to-business -business, um, assistance and support and to help provide, ensure that there are financial models that will work for those throughout the sector, not just the top office buildings in the city, but all the way through uh, the building stock that's there. Oops, I did that again. 
Can I go back? Thank you. Um, so some of the types of policies that cities are engaging on, all of these really require private sector support and engagement to be successful. So um, leadership by example is where the cities are making their own buildings more highly energy efficient, net zero energy. Um, building codes is a big place where you must have private sector support, both in building uh, the model codes, which are a collaborative effort, but then for state and local adoption and compliance. So that's a really critical area. Um, incentives can directly help more and more um, private sector businesses engage and as I mentioned, benchmarking uh, both voluntary and mandatory programs. There's uh, a lot of learning that needs to go on, and that's some place where we've been able to engage our business members to provide pro bono help on helping, you know, all kinds of um, small business and nonprofits do their benchmarking and learn how to do it. And we're seeing a trend in the U.S. in some leading cities is now building performance. So if you score a certain amount on your ENERGY STAR score, you have to do a building tune-up every so often. Or you have to, uh, eventually we're going to be seeing um, targets for building performance. And that will really be a huge push to get to our existing building stock. I think I'm short on time, is that correct? <laughs> So I'm going to just move through here. I just wanted to mention LEAD is one example where we really tried to um, incorporate climate goals as an underlying um, intent of the LEAD V4 system through a number of areas, not just energy, but also water, um, waste, each of which have embodied carbon. And the whole idea really is to help support a pull so that we can um, not just reward the top buildings, but to show that this is possible to um, increase the local awareness and uh, workforce capacity, building materials, so that eventually all buildings can be high performing, energy efficient green buildings by driving up the building code. So the idea is this is a, a top to bottom continuous process. And this is. Um, and lastly, uh, as I mentioned, uh, embodied carbon and materials, and this is really another place where the private sector is so important to do that R&D to come up with innovations in materials that help support net zero buildings and uh, highly efficient buildings, as well as to um, potentially bind carbon and be part of the solution because it's gonna be, um, we need everything in, we need all in to address this challenge. Thank you. So now we are going to have a video presentation by Clay Nessler of Johnson Controls and his colleague, um, Anta Giran, is here and will speak afterwards. So at this point, I think we're going to load the video. Give us one moment. <laughs> Anda, what we could always do is have you come up first while they're working on the technology. So let's just give it a moment and see what we can do. We were trying something new here. Let's, we'll be patient and we will make sure that it, it comes across. While we're waiting, actually, I just have one follow-up question for the two of you, actually, Elizabeth and Laura. You talked a lot about um, public-private partnerships, and that's certainly a trend you know, that we speak about a lot. But just wondering, can, it's becoming a buzzword more than something that people clearly understand. How would you define a successful public-private partnership? What does that mean in its core? I think it starts with a dialogue, but then it really, I guess, to be successful, ends in an action of some sort. Mm -hmm. So one example from the Amplify program, which was uh, WBCSDs, they did a pilot in Houston, and they pulled together a private sector from throughout the building supply chain and uh, did a 
a series of informed workshops and figured out what really were the barriers. You know, why were only you know the the top buildings um, going for energy efficiency, and how could they help you know create a bigger market for energy ac uh, efficiency activities and to improve common goals. And one of the outcomes there was to uh, develop a PACE program, Property Assessed Clean Energy, which is a financing mechanism that's very attractive to business since you don't have to tie up your working capital, but it um, uses the value of your property to finance improvements to the property based on the energy savings. So they worked with the city. Um, pri when the private sector says, hey, you can do this, you have the authority, it's, and it's really going to help us and create jobs in your city as well as save energy. Um, that's a win-win. So they were able to work together and develop that program. Laura, do you have any comments? Yes. Sorry. Um, from the perspective of the Alliance to Save Energy, where our focus is and has always been on strong energy efficiency policy, for us, when we talk about partnering with, with the private sector, we're talking, or with public and private sector, we're talking about how to advocate for the most, um, the strongest feasible and most effective policy that makes sense for the private sector as well. So we talk about having private sector actors being at the table when we talk about policy making, making sure that we're all on the same page about you know what what won't hurt business, um, but what can really move the country forward in terms of strong policy. So we like to have um, public and private sector uh, discussions. We like to make sure that our private sector partners are with us when we go and talk with legislators about what we think makes a good energy efficiency policy. Thank you. So it's fostering a dialogue, identifying a common understanding of a problem, and then ideally resulting in an action. And the action could be policy, or it could be new business models. It just it depends. So I look forward to exploring this more, especially in the second part of our uh, panel discussion. So I think we are ready now for the video. Thank you both for letting me ask you that follow-up question. So, Clay Nestle. Good afternoon. I'm Clay Nestler, Vice President of Global Sustainability and Industry Initiatives for Johnson Controls. I'm standing here outside the U.S. Green Building Council booth at Green Build in Boston, Massachusetts. Today's opening day for an exposition that started in 2002 with about 500 individuals coming to share best practices and demonstrate technologies for sustainable buildings. Today's conference will have over 20,000 attendees, 500 companies will be showing their sustainable products, technology, services and solutions for sustainable buildings. One of the things I like best about Green Build is the hundreds of individuals from countries around the world that come together from Green Building Councils to share best practices and coordinate their efforts on a global basis. Speaking of international sustainability, we just completed the 11th edition of our Energy Efficiency Indicator Survey. This survey interviews executives at over 1,500 organizations, commercial, institutional, and industrial, in 12 countries around the world. Some of the key highlights are that 70% said they're paying more attention to energy efficiency and clean energy technologies today than they were a year ago, and 58% said they plan to increase investment in the next year. When asked what key drivers were for investment in energy efficiency, it was surprising that the number two ranked driver was greenhouse gas emissions reductions. What's perhaps even more surprising is that in the United States, that was the number one driver of investment. Some of the trends we've been tracking over the last couple of years around net zero, near zero, and positive energy buildings. 54% of organizations on a global basis said they plan to have one of those type of facilities over the next 10 years. Another really interesting trend is around resiliency. 52% said that within the next 10 years, they plan to have at least one facility which would be able to operate off the grid and respond to severe weather events and the grid going down. These are important trends for the industry and expansion of the decades-long green building movement. While improvement measures like HVAC, lighting, and controls are typically the most popular measures implemented, two things rose to the top for planned investments next year. One is renewable energy on site, and the second is, surprisingly, energy storage. Those two technologies 
when you think about net zero energy buildings and you think about resilience and operating off the grid will become critical technologies combined with traditional energy efficiency measures to not only improve sustainability, but the resilience of facilities. Policy is another important driver of investment in energy efficiency and clean energy technologies in the building sector. 52% of organizations said that government policy was very or extremely important in driving increased investment in energy efficiency. The number one driver out of a number of different policies which were surveyed is actually benchmarking and certification. It's interesting, I'm here in the U.S. Green Building Council booth where the LEED rating system is probably the most popular global certification, voluntary certification for buildings. There are also very important mandatory benchmarking and transparency laws around the world. Here in the United States, many cities have adopted these policies as well as a few states. And Europe, of course, has had mandatory uh, disclosure of building performance for many years. These are important emerging trends which really bode well for greater investment in buildings in the future. It's been great to join you, albeit remotely, from Green Build here in Boston. I wish the panel great success and success to the overall COP23 in Bonn. So as the time we speak, Clay is heading to the airport and he's, get, he's getting here to, to Bonn. I came from Brussels just two hours by driving, so um, today we thought that if we're in Bonn, let's look at the energy efficiency indicator and how, how those global achievements and global ambi ambitions that are implemented at the regional level in Europe, for example. So Clay was talking about the energy efficiency indicator uh, and 400 respondents, facility managers from commercial buildings, are from, uh, from Europe. And we focus this year on Germany, Poland, and, and France, very different countries in Europe um, regarding to energy efficiency ambitious, ambitions. So this, this time we saw weekly that Europe this year is a bit better than the US, if we can say it this way, because 80% of the organizations are paying more attention to energy efficiency and renewables, which is 10% more than, than the global results that Clay just, uh, just mentioned to you. 66 of uh, organizations that we interviewed, they, um, they, they want to increase the energy efficiency and the renewables investments in the next year. So things are positively on the paper because I will tell you more um, about the policies as well. Why in Europe they do it because of money, because of cost, cost savings, this is the, the main um, Result, um, a reason, 77%. But then you have as well the other global factors that Clay mentioned, uh, the greenhouse gas footprint, the energy security, very important uh, on this part of the world, and the building resilience. Now in Europe we have a law, um, it's, we call it a directive, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, which is the main law for, uh, for buildings. And we have this uh, mandatory requirement that all buildings become nearly zero energy buildings by 2021, which means they are very energy performant and they have some, uh, some energy needs satisfied by local renewables. So that's why in Europe, more, more organization, which means 80% would go for a nearly zero energy building than globally, what Clay was saying, 51% um, just in Europe for a certified building. So the, the trend of nearly zero energy building is very high in, in Europe. Building performance uh, benchmarking and certification was, very, was ranked very high as well by, uh, by, by Europeans. But now I would go um, back to, um, I will continue by talking a bit about jobs and, and the European growth and what the building, what a company like Johnson Controls and many others in the, in, in, in the same sector, the energy renovation do for the European economy. You should know that the construction sector in Europe has a turnover of 1.241 billion euros. This is more, more than 9% of the European GDP, it's huge. Of this figure that I just told you, 57% is the renovation sector. So companies like Philips, UTC here in the room, Johnson Controls and others. In Europe we have this, perhaps it's 
it's, it's similar like with other regions, but mo mo the most of those companies, 92% are very small companies employing less than 10 people. Now, if we go to the energy renovation sector, the jobs that we have today in Europe is there are one, 882 million jobs um, in all 28 countries, which is huge and which, is, uh, which, which, can, which, which can increase even more if those directives that I just mentioned, that we're advocating for, for, here, for, for them here in Europe, would, would show to the business the long-term perspective. This is what we need. This is what Johnson Controls needs. This is what other companies need, a long-term perspective in Europe. So we urge EU policymakers and EU ministers, when they sign climate agreements like the Paris Agreement, to think about how they, they will implement each of those actions at the local level. So nearly zero energy building could be the vision for 2050. Then we, we also had a very good vote in the European Parliament a few weeks ago, stating that we should have a decarbonized building stock which would be great if we go there and, and if we ensure that in all countries of Europe we have this kind of building stock. In business, we, we have KPIs, so we would like uh, that countries in Europe, perhaps others as well, to have 2030, 2040 milestones, so we know exactly each by year the progress and to track the, this, this progress. There are two other things that I would mention quickly. Uh, the harmonization of the standards in Europe, each country, I'm sure it's a bit different than the US. Each, each country decides about how they measure the energy performance of, um, of their buildings. So we would like to harmonize those standards and to look at a building um, with, through the same standards. We have them now. They're made by the European Commission and the, CEN, the European Certification um, Standardization Body. We just need to use them. And my last point would be about, um, about the, the energy renovations. There are very small projects uh, generally in Europe, and what we would need is a mechanism of aggregation to put them together and to show to investors that energy efficiency is, um, is, is big. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, as, as said earlier by Lisa, my name is Ben Gruitt, and I'm a director of uh, sustainability and advanced bioproducts for the Corn Refiners Association. Uh, we are the association that represents the corn wet milling industry in the United States, producing food, feed, and bioproducts from a variety of parts of the corn plant. Uh, besides the national presence in the United States, we all, our members also operate 32 facilities in 22 countries around the world as well. Uh, so as we're here talking about the business case for climate solutions, uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, there's really two overarching aspects to uh, bringing climate solution, bringing the climate problem within range uh, of what is acceptable. So a lot of a lot of discussion today and around the COP has been about uh, decoupling uh, GHG emissions from economic development. Uh, through energy efficiency initiatives, through renewable chemicals for more efficient agriculture, transportation needs, uh, any number of things that you've seen around COP so far. Uh, but it's important to know that uh, the latest research has shown that uh, even at the rate that the entire industry and the entire globe is moving to decarbonize, uh, a lot of the research shows that this is probably not going to be enough to keep below uh, 2 degrees Celsius, let alone 1.5 degrees Celsius. So the second aspect that we need to start to consider and start to, to implement is carbon removal services from here. So back in June, you may have seen uh, a press release that a company called, I believe, Climeworks AG uh, in Switzerland operated the first carbon, direct carbon capture and removal uh, facility. Uh, what they did is they, they have these large fans, they capture the carbon dioxide from the air, and they pump it into a greenhouse to help grow vegetables, uh, to the best of my knowledge. I think the, the most important thing coming out of that story was not necessarily that the plant uh, is online, but I think that it helps to change the narrative around, uh, clim uh, around carbon dioxide. The current narrative in climate change circles is that carbon dioxide is inherently bad. 
And that's not necessarily the case. If we reframe the climate problem from carbon dioxide is inherently bad to carbon dioxide is simply in the wrong place, then it makes the, the business solutions much more approachable from, uh, from the standpoint of addressing the solutions. So besides that facility that directly captures from the air, uh, there's something, there's, there's an entire process that's been going on for millions of years that captures carbon dioxide directly from the air, and that's simply photosynthesis. Plants take carbon from the atmosphere, use it for their structural needs, and return uh, what they don't need to the soil in exchange for nitrogen and phosphorus and other minerals uh, within the soil biome. So there's a solution out there that uh, we can use to our advantage to help fight climate change. And I'm talking about the, the use of biorefineries. So currently, biorefineries produce things that you're probably very familiar with, uh, as we talked about food and feed and fuel. Uh, but there's a whole, a whole segment of research and an increasingly uh, advanced one that's focusing on products and chemicals as well. So I just wanted to, to lay the foundation of what's happening in the industry now so you can get a better understanding for where, where we are now and where we're going and how this plays into the solutions overall. So the, the hottest area in uh, biorefineries and the bioeconomy overall is the production of enzymes and the commercialization of enzymes. And enzymes are simply, simply substances produced by uh, biological processes that are, act as a catalyst for a biochemical reaction. The, the easiest one and most simple one is the conversion of starches to sugars for brewing beer. Uh, Enzymes form the foundation for everything that is happening now and everything is, that is to come, and that's simply because nature provides a near countless variety of enzymes that produce any number of, of chemical outcomes that come out of it. And so as, as researchers and companies are beginning to catalog uh, and discover what these enzymes do and their unique properties, they're getting a better understanding for for what chemicals and what materials can come out of biorefineries. Uh, the second place, second place to look at is base chemicals. These are uh, essentially your monomers and your intermediate chemicals uh, that have a variety of uses uh, to produce more advanced products. They are really kind of the second, second foundation of it. Uh, in terms of biorefineries, succinic acid is, is one example of an organic acid that has a multitude of uses further down the right line for more sophisticated chemical products that can be used in consumer chemicals. Uh, we're seeing in the United States, and I know in Europe, uh, a greater emphasis on drop-in renewable replacements for standard uh, cleaning products, detergents, uh, a variety of uh, cosmetics and home goods products that are being used. Uh, commercial chemicals are, for lack of a better, a better analogy, the canary in the coal mine. So companies that are producing drop-in replacements are able to do this cost-effectively because they understand the chemical process that does so. They're able to vet marketing strategies uh, for how to produce these, and they're also able to fund ongoing research and development for more sophisticated products like specialty chemical products, which are, are adhesives and lubricants, uh, polymers and elastomers. Uh, which are, are higher value products. They can act as replacement for incumbent industry products. And in certain cases where you have durable goods, think of, of maybe you know, your laptop shell or auto body parts, uh, they can act as effective carbon sinks due to their long usage. So that's where the industry is at now. We're really laying the foundation for what's to come next. And the emerging products, some of these are already being commercialized as we speak, and some, some are shortly to commercialization. Uh, 3D printing filaments, there is a company called uh, NatureWorks that is currently producing a, a bio-based filament for the 3D printers. When you combine the, the radical efficiency of 3D printing with the renewable production of filaments, you really get some increased efficiency in, the manufacturing process and if that can be scaled to the entire manufacturing industry or at least the ones where it makes economic sense to do so, you can really spare resources down the line. Uh, another area of advent is smart materials and these are materials that react to the environment around them when uh, stimulated by something external like light or temperature or pressure. Uh, the picture here shows a car. There's a, there's a paint made from corn cyclodextrins that self-heals small scratches like this. And so this may seem like a, a small, 
innovation now, but think of the think of the maintenance costs that go into building materials and automobiles and the cost savings and, and resource savings that can be achieved through smart materials that can, can self-repair. Uh, another area we're looking into co uh, composite materials. Many of these are based on uh, carbon fibers, which offer a significant advantage in high strength and low weight ratio. Uh, there's a lot of work being done in this space, too, to commercialize these from renewable sources, which would not only lower the greenhouse gas emissions for carbon fiber production, uh, but would also uh, reduce the cost over time of production. And composite materials are, are one of those areas that uh, are currently being produced and used in, in aerospace engineering uh, and certain, certain sporting materials too. As, of, as it stands right now, they're currently on the expensive side, but if we can lower the cost, you can see, you can see uses in aviation, uh, wind, turbine conduction, wind turbine production, building materials and infrastructure. Uh, the weight alone would, would save uh, an incredible amount of fuel and electricity in aviation and transport overall. And then finally, on the, the functional foods and flavoring side, uh, we're on the cusp of, by 2050, having an additional 2 billion people on the planet, and by 2035, uh, 3 billion people that are on the planet now are going to enter the global middle class. Uh, these everybody's going to be looking for resources, and we are in a finite uh, world with limited resources. So one of the things uh, that's coming out of these is how can we produce vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, flavorings to ensure that uh, people are fed with resource efficiency uh, while conserving land use, making sure that we, we don't use all the arable land that can be used for uh, biodiversity uh, and uh, indigenous rights as well. Uh, so if we look at the, if we look at the really simplistic flow chart of a biorefinery. You can see it's a, it's a biomass-based feedstock, feeds into a biorefinery, and produces products on the under, other end of things. If you look at this uh, for any length of time, you'll realize that, that something's missing from the process overall. And that's uh, two waste streams, or, or what are currently viewed as waste streams. Uh, CO2, uh, fermentation tanks produce CO2, much as if you're, if you're baking bread, uh, yeast produces uh, both, both sugars and carbon dioxide that help lift the bread. Uh, carbon dioxide in a pure stream is, is much e easier to capture and utilize or store underground more cost efficiently. And the other thing is the, the bio wastewater stream. These are all uh, biological products coming out in wastewater, which have uh, implications and potential uses in capturing renewable resources. There's a company uh, out of Iowa that's using uh, uh, proprietary algal technology to capture nitrogen and phosphorus, pelletize it, and use it as an organic fertilizer in farming. So what we can do in this space is essentially help close the loop on biorefineries, making them more efficient, not just from a cost perspective, but also from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective, which has the potential, as vetted through life cycle analyses, to uh, lower them to carbon neutral or ideally carbon negative facilities. Obviously, there's a, a lot of work a long way, way between here and there, but it does offer one of the most promising uh, opportunities to uh, produce carbon negative materials overall. Uh, so, I just want to say in closing, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of work being done in the place, a lot of commercial successes already, uh, and still a lot of work to be done. This is by no means certain uh, that this, this entire space of the bioeconomy is going to be, be achieved. Um, there's some very positive signs. There, there's an abundance of cost competitive feedstocks. There's early commercial successes for Pioneer product, uh, and there's ongoing investment in the commercialization of innovative research. That being said, uh, there's a lot more that can be done, uh, specifically from the policy side. Uh, there's there's public-private partnerships, as, as we talked about earlier. There's a biorefinery construction assistance to help offset the costs between pilot and scalability of these products. Uh, there's workforce training. Uh, biorefineries need a lot of engineers to help run them and a lot of researchers to help discover new and novel uses for, for enzymes and microorganisms that produce these products. Uh, public education and awareness of the space. 
would be very beneficial. Uh, and there's, there's things like uh, tax policies, which would be helpful as well. Uh, all of this can, can be a big part of the, the climate solution from the business aspect, and I think a lot of it is happening in the space, uh, kind of under the radar at the moment, but, but don't be surprised to see within the next few years that this space really opens up and becomes more aware. So thank you very much. We're going to shift to the next panel, but I had asked a few couple of follow-up questions to Laura and Liz Beardsley. And I just wanted to ask very quickly a follow-up question to Anda and to Ben. Ben, I'll start with you. So, I mean, pretty, really amazing. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. And often you don't hear that type of discussion um, here at the COP. So thanks for bringing that to us. What, from your standpoint, what is the driver of this shift um, in the industry? Can you just tell a little bit about that? Sure, and I think, uh you're right, we don't hear much about it in this space, so this is probably a more apt analogy for the canary in the coal mine, that being me. Uh, so I really hope you know I answer this well. I think the biggest, biggest drive right now is the, uh, the reduction in technological costs. So if you look at the, if you look at the sequencing of uh, DNA, uh, which I don't know if anyone remembers Craig Venter, who first, first sequenced the human genome in 1995, uh, it took him took him 10 years and $13 billion to sequence the first genome uh, in 1995. 11 years later, in 2006, it took roughly $14 million and, and about four months to sequence a genome. 2016 took less than $1,000 and about a day to sequence a genome. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see in the next five years for that cost to be in and around $100 and be done with a matter of hours. So as these costs are coming down, it's becoming more accessible for researchers to get out there and use this technology to discover novel uses. And as these novel uses are found, uh, they, it's allowing businesses to, to find ways to create products and services that are you know, of benefit to society while still being profitable. Thank you. Um, Anda, you know, Clay, that video was, was fabulous. He got so much information in there. And the work that uh, Johnson Controls supports in terms of surveying um, globally uh, building managers is, is really astounding. And then to see the different trends year on year and also over you know, chunks of time. So Clay listed many things he thought was significant. What would be something from your standpoint, um, given the European perspective, that you thought was particularly striking this year? I think there is this um, inconsistency between what the people want on the field, like f the facility managers, and what they can achieve, and sometimes the ambitions of the politicians. So I think there is, they could work more together. This is what, what goes out from the survey in Europe, that they want more energy efficiency and more renewables. So having a more ambitious energy performance of buildings directive over more energy efficiency directive is not scaring people. So politicians can vote in favor of this uh, of those laws because it's already happening at the local level. Thank you. Well, I hope you'll stick around for the discussion portion. Um, please have a seat. I'd like to invite the uh, second panel to come up, please. Welcome, everybody. Um, so this is the, the second part of our discussion. Again, we are here focused on technology. What are the key trends? What are the key challenges? How does it fit into the discussions here uh, at the COP? And you know, what are um, the things that we should leave this two weeks with in terms of forward-looking action so we can increase the ambition? We have a number of experts here. I'd, I'd like to introduce them. Um, and then I'm going to give 
I'll, I'll in introduce them for you, but then I'm going to give them each a chance to talk in a little bit more detail about the company or organization that they're with and you know the role that that entity plays in terms of moving forward with climate mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency. And then we're going to move into a discussion and save some time for everybody uh, to ask some questions towards the end. So I'm, I'm pleased to introduce our panelists, John Kataszewski, Senior Director for Strategic Initiatives at Winrock International, Harry Verhar, Head of Global Public and Government Affairs at Philips Lighting, and Thomas Weber, President of Jupiter Oxygen Corporation. And I believe, I just want to confirm that that's the order, if they have slides, that they would be speaking in. So we, okay, great. So. Um, we'll also have Jeff Moe with us, who's Director for Global Product Advocacy at the Center for Energy Efficiency and Sustainability at Ingersoll Rand, but he's coming from another event, so we might have to, to, sorry? Perfect. So I think we'll be good to go, but if we have any snags, you will, you'll set us in the right direction. So we're going to hear from John first. John, do you want to stand up, or do you want to do your uh, opening comments from here? I can do them from my seat here. Okay, and did you have slides? Um, there's one slide that would be useful to have up as background. Is that a good one for That's you? That's the one, yes. Okay, perfect. The floor is yours. Yeah, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start out by telling a story of small milk producers in Kenya. So if you're a small, what does that mean, a small milk producer in Kenya? If you're a small milk producer in Kenya, you might have three to five cows. And each one of those cows might produce about eight liters of milk per day. And you would get that milk with two milkings per day, one in the morning and one in the evening. And usually the morning milking is about 60% of the milk production and the evening is 40% of the milk production. And you would have a problem because the milk that you produced in the morning would have a ready market for people who are gonna consume that milk during the day. But the milk that you produce at night doesn't have a ready market because most people are asleep. And so that milk is generally not sold. It's either force consumed by the family, shared with neighbors, but it does not produce any benefit. And so if you look at the national milk production statistics in Kenya, 40% of the milk produced is not consumed. 40% of the milk produced is not consumed. And so what I want to talk about is the challenges of what can you do about that challenge? Um, how can you address that in a, in a way that makes sense? And what's happened in, in relatively unknown fashion, but well, I guess it's known because people say the cost of renewables have come down, but you know, what does that really mean? And I'll, I'll give you some numerical examples of what does that mean in this particular case. But you know, renewable energy technology now is per completely uh, cost competitive and can recover uh, the cost of the investment um, uh, in, a, in, in less than a year for many of these investments. And so there's other challenges, but the, the, the product I want to point out here is one that came out of NASA research initially. So NASA research was working on these um, uh, com direct compressor um, technologies. So in this system, uh, you one of the things you have to worry about is how do you operate and maintain these things? And many solar systems have been plagued by the need for batteries and the, the challenge of putting a controller with those batteries and then being able to operate the system and having people out and available who can take care of it and fix it. This system um, gets rid of the batteries. And so instead of using a battery for storage, it uses ice for storage. Because what are you trying to do? You're trying to cool that milk down so that the time between when, it's, when the milking occurs and when it's taken to the market at a lower temperature you have less uh, biological activity to degrade the quality of the milk. Um, and so with a direct compressor, you can produce ice during the day when the sun is out, and that ice can then serve as the storage medium overnight um, for keeping milk cold. Uh, and so that reduces the costs and reduces the complexity of the system. A couple steps further. Um, so now another thing that happens is even change the design of your panels. And so if you look at that picture on the left and you see the panels, um, a lot of the solar systems will talk about, well, we can get better efficiency if we have a tracking system. Um, well, in this particular case, you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to maximize the number of hours a day in which you can make ice. 
And so there's a, a fixed tracking system here where you basically point one set of panels east and one set of panels west, <laughs> and then you get the maximum number of hours per day when your compressor will produce uh, ice. Um, and that turns out to be, uh, although might not produce the amount of power from the cells, it produces more ice, and that's what we're storing, and that's what we, that's what we care about. So now, what's the impact that this uh, ice has? Well, now you've effectively uh, increased the earning capacity of that, at that, of that household. Um, and so the amount that you increase the earning capacity, um, you know, in the, in the work that we've done, the data collected, you know, it can be depending on how many cows you have, between $60 and $500 a month. Um, and so you can look at a jump in income uh, for a typical Kenyan farmer of uh, maybe 25%. What's it cost for one of these systems? The, the retail cost for this system uh, as delivered is about just under $2,000, $1,850. Um, and so with that, how long does it take for the increased income to pay it back? Well, you're typically getting, um, for, for that volume, um, about $2,000 to $2,500 increase in, in income. So in one year, this will pay for itself. Um, so now, why isn't there a massive <laughs> movement to uh, develop and install these technologies? Well, having a technology that works at a cost-effective price is not all that it takes to get these things disseminated in the marketplace. So you know, one of the things that my organization, Winrock, does is we, we try to uh, help scale these technologies that are clearly uh, beneficial and have a major impact on you know, some of the poorest populations on a global basis. So what does that mean? I think there's three primary functions that we have to perform. One function we have to perform is quality control. Because as you might guess, as soon as you produce one of these products and it's shown to work, then you'll have a number of other people who rush into the marketplace who don't really quite produce the product to work. <laughs> and then that takes advantage of uh, uh, a population that you really don't want to have taken advantage of. So there's a quality control function. Um, you want to make sure that the products that are being put out there uh, work. Uh, a second challenge is the aggregation challenge. So yes, it might seem like under $2,000 a unit for these, it'd be easy to sell those in a chain store, but there's no chain stores. <laughs> so how are you going to get a distribution network in place to, to sell and service uh, this uh, kind of equipment? And so a function that we provide is an aggregation function. We work with local uh, groups, both private for-profit companies and um, cooperatives. So in the case in Kenya where this project is, we're working with the with SACOs, as they're called. These are the Saving and Credit Cooperative Associations uh, in Kenya. And this is groups of small farmers that get together and that can mobilize capital more quickly. And that's the third function that we try to provide is, is capital mobilization. Because even though these sound like small amounts and they pay back, if you have nobody, who are, would you lend to a f farmer in rural Kenya with three cows? We're actually testing that question with crowdfunding because I think many people would say yes if you present them with clear numbers like this that said we can improve, uh, we're, we're, we're going to take what is now a wasted product. 40% of the milk in Kenya is wasted and that nobody uses it. We're going we're gonna to capture that wasted product and put it into the marketplace. So we're experimenting with the crowdfunding side, but at least in the beginning what we're saying is can we look, use more traditional pathways to get credit out into these uh, organizations and, and uh, um, bring benefits. Um, and so that's the main story I wanted to tell. Um, I can tell, I'll give you other examples of similar technologies that are um, making a big difference and facing similar challenges, but um, happy to do that in the question session. And thank you, and thanks for giving, you know, again, we've been talking mostly about building, so it's good to have um, a contrast set, you know, trying to solve a range of, you know, development challenges and economic challenges with new technologies. But ultimately, um, if they aren't deployed uh, in an economically sustainable manner, uh, they won't be successful in the long term. So there are some universal challenges that we all face when it comes to deploying technologies. But we are going to go back and talk a little bit um, about lighting. So our next speaker to offer some opening comments is Harry Farhar. Yes. 
So, yeah, good afternoon. So it's good to be in Germany for the Fijian COP. And I think also because of the difference in climate, I felt when walking in that Germany was using its excess renewable energy to create a climate like we were on Fiji. Uh, but fortunately, it's a bit cooler now. What I wanted to do is to share you a little bit of what is happening in, in, in the lighting sector. I think many of you are aware of some of the changes. And I'll, I'll share a bit uh, yeah, why this is important, uh, what, what's more to it. And I'll show also some project examples to make it tangible as we are probably all of us on the same wavelength so that we also learn from each other and use each other's examples to, let's say, to replicate and scale uh, uh, yeah, to the momentum that we need. Because we also know from last week's emission gap report that was launched by UN Environment, uh, that there's still there's a lot of good things happening, but still uh, there's a lot, lot to do to close that gap. So let's see if this works. Yep. So with this graph, I'd like to explain. So we do a lot of work as Philips Lighting, because of course we also want to be um, in the team that wins. And the winning team is the, is the clean energy team. Uh, we also do a lot of work as a lighting sector. I remember really well, I started the project to phase out inefficient lighting globally at the end of 2003. And one of the first things I did was to speak through the lighting association with our biggest competitors. Uh, about yeah, a common future that we could create. And I also felt, and I said it to them, it's going to be m much more fun huh, to compete in a better future uh, than to move in opposing directions. Uh, and then thirdly, we do a lot of work in the energy efficiency domain, huh, and some areas have been covered. And that is also why with my friend Clay Nessler, that you saw in the video, that three years ago we suggested to the UN to create, to do more work on energy efficiency and actually to double the rate of energy efficiency improvement and that created the energy efficiency accelerator platform, where there are projects on appliances, on buildings, on lighting, on district heating, transport and industry, because yeah, we need all of those had to make the contribution uh, that, yeah, that, let's say that's the promise of energy efficiency. Well, back to this graph. In 2006, in December 2006, uh, following the first few years of work we did on lighting, showing that lighting was 19%, so almost one fifth of global electricity, quite significant and how much that could be reduced in December that year, uh, we called for the global phase out of incandescent light bulbs. And at the time it was yeah, headline news, it was also a shock <laughs> to many people, because they felt like, hey, this, this, this nice bulb has been there forever, uh, uh, from the days of our grandparents, and it's just not possible. And we should also imagine this was the first mass electric appliance, because uh, when it was launched in the late 19th uh, century, there was nothing else that worked on electricity. Uh, but then, and then to call for that phase out, uh, that was kind of a revolution. I think it was both symbolic because of all the history behind it, but it was also really important because only 1%, if you go from the power plant uh, to, let's say, to sitting underneath a fixture, uh, then only 1% of input energy was turned into lumens, uh, the unit of light. Well, at that time, <coughs> so we called for this global phase. At that time, lighting used 19% of global electricity. Two years ago at COP15, uh, when we did more work on lighting, but also where we showed that we walked the talk and made a commitment to become carbon neutral as a company by 2020, it was already down to 15, and in 2030 it will be down to 8. 8% 8 of global electricity. And we know we need that electricity uh, because of the challenges in transport and, and other areas. But then it's not only the technology that is changing, and that is what I want to share with you with this graph, it's also, let's say, the way that Light, let's say that lighting is being brought to the market, that our customers work with it, that the business is conducted. So it, you could really say, and I think you, you will have a sense of that when I explain, how that we used to be a replacement market that worked through electrical distribution and installers. Huh? So not only in Holland, but in many cities across the world, huh? then the facility manager of the city cycling at night through the city looking what works and what doesn't, and in the morning huh, going to a distributor and then buying the, the bulbs uh, that he needed to replace during the day. And the same in buildings and in our homes. And you see now how uh, we've really moved to lighting as a system in the middle, uh, so including optics, electronics, and optimizing how it performs. But then thirdly, also with the fact that LEDs are digital, uh, they're really small chips, you could say, and you can connect them, uh, that we look at lighting really as, a, as projects. So we can do, because of the digital nature, and that not only goes for lighting, how you can do larger scale projects. And that's one way, of course, uh, to increase the momentum on, on, on mitigation of carbon emissions. 
So we do city scale, we do company scale, so we also talk to different people. Facility managers remain to be important, uh, but then you can talk to the C-suite, you can talk to the city mayor's office and say, let's do something that's really bigger, but it also that creates benefits for your city. Now, before I show a few examples, a few numbers, what we see, and that's because of population growth, growth of middle class, that has been mentioned before, and because of urbanization, that the growth in the number of light points between 2006, huh, this last slowly evolutionary year when things were changing, and now things changing faster, to 2030, the number of light points will grow by 50%, five zero. And the same is valid, of course, huh, for other appliances, which is why it is so important had to make, yeah, to make more speed in, in addressing this. But then, despite that growth of 50%, from 46 to 70 billion light points, almost, almost 10 per capita, then we will have a 53% reduction in energy consumption. And that contributes 1,400, 1,400 megatons in carbon emissions, uh, yeah, which is one, one of the megatons that, that we need. Then let, let me, be, let me be, be limited on, on, on more numbers, but let's go to some examples. Uh, so the use of lighting, actually the largest use is in, in public and commercial buildings, 60%, because we spend so much time there. Have working, learning, shopping, and, and, and all of that. Um, and there you can save up to 70% quite often if you move to connected LED, LED lighting. Another example is cities. So 15% of electricity for lighting is outdoor. Uh, the remaining 25 is residential, quickly going down, because uh, all, all of us are moving to, to a lot of LEDs at home. But then here, there's a bit more to this example that I wanted to share. You see here Los Angeles, that has moved to connected LED street lighting, and also Buenos Aires. 91,000 pieces, and both of them saved significant amounts of energy. In LA, about two thirds, about $10 million a year. That can be used for other things, healthcare, education, and many other smart things that are happening in California. And Buenos Aires, about 50%. But what also happened is that you, when you look beyond the carbon and beyond the energy budget, actually all these solutions that are more sustainable, more durable, smarter, they provide what you could call social benefits. Uh, the real benefits why you use those uh, solutions. And in this case, the World Council on City Data, who are headquartered in Toronto, and who created the City Performance Indicator Index on, on all the 17 SDGs, helping cities to set ambitions in a way that they can also learn from each other and can jointly track their progress. They researched uh, two things, so crime and traffic accidents in these cities and a few other cities in total, 10 cities, and they found that the switch to LED lighting, which also has a better light quality, reduced crime rates by 21%, so street crime, so robbery, burglary, assaults, by 21%. And it reduced nighttime traffic accidents by 30%, so about a third. And you would say, well, hey, this makes it really easy, uh, or easier uh, for a mayor, had uh, to explain to, to his population, like, this is actually also why it's good for you and why we're, why we're doing this. And you see similar examples in productivity in the workplace, uh, learning effectiveness in schools, and I think also if we add this to the narrative, uh, we all know we need to do this, and that is why we have these jobs, these missions, it's more than a job, but then if we add this perspective, uh, why it's good for everyone, I think then we can create that momentum. And the momentum, last word on that, that we need is that currently, the rate of energy efficiency improvement is only 1.5% per year, it needs to move to three, so three is the magic number. Anything we need to do, we need to do by 3% per year, about 30 years till 2050, and then you know why. Uh, but then if we do that, uh, it also creates a lot of jobs because you need people uh, to make those renovations, to, to install those products, uh, to replace all of that. So that, that, that's just, yeah, it's just a huge opportunity, and I think if we collectively add these examples uh, in our narratives, uh, it will certainly help uh, to create the speed that we need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have two more uh, panelists that are going to make comments, uh, Jeff Moe and Thomas Weber. And uh, I think I'm going to have Jeff come up next, please. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Lisa. Sorry I'm late, everyone. Um, I want to provide a little bit of context. So I'm with Ingersoll Rand, Ingersoll Rand's diversified products business. and uh, a few years ago, we decided, uh, very top down, our CEO decided, very interesting, uh, chief executive officer, but he said, we're going to integrate sustainability into our business strategy. 
Sustainability for us is three things. First, it's profitable growth. Second, it's improving social status around the world. And third, it's environmental improvement. And as we did this, we wanted something that was in front of us that could be transformational for our business. We want it to be transparent. We want it to be accountable. And so we came up with what we call our climate commitment. Our climate commitment has three elements. First, it's about taking our portfolio and the greenhouse gas emissions of our portfolio and reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2020. Second, it's about looking internally at our own facilities and reducing the greenhouse gas emissions there by 35%, again, by 2020. And thirdly, it's recognizing that without money to make investments, this is going to be rather difficult. So we set aside $500 million for investments to drive creation of new products and new services. For those new products and new services that are most significant, we created a new brand of products called EcoWise. I'll talk about that in the next slide. So it, it, it's always nice to make a commitment. It's easy to make a commitment. Sometimes it's more difficult to hit that commitment, especially when you make a commitment where you don't know how you're going to achieve it when you make it, which is the situation we were in. So through 2016, as you can see in the bottom of the slide, we're halfway to hitting our commitment around our product portfolio greenhouse gas footprint. We are on track to hit our overall 35% internal greenhouse gas emissions. We're 16% reduction so far. And we've spent uh, $200 million to date. So we're well on track to hit these commitments by 2020. Next slide. All right, I mentioned briefly EcoWise portfolio. Um, I wanted to show that we actually have introduced new products that fit our rigid definition of EcoWise portfolio. We actually are selling these new products. We're making money from these new products. We're doing this because we think it will drive profitable growth, and we're seeing that growth already occur. One of the reasons we're in this process is we're taking a lead ahead of policy. There's always some risk when you're taking lead ahead of policy, although we do have customers that are asking for this. Uh, policy becomes very important so that we can reinvest and invest more aggressively and add even more products and drive even more revenue through this portfolio. The other element of getting out there first and having real solutions is it makes policymakers more comfortable putting policy in place because they don't have to put it in place and hope that somebody delivers solutions. We have solutions, we have solutions today, and we want to give them that comfort they can move forward. So thanks for your time. Thomas Weber, you are our next speaker. Thank you, Lisa, for the kind introduction and the invitation. Uh, my name is Thomas Weber, Jupiter Auction Corporation. We are a clean energy technology company uh, located in the US, Chicago. We are specialized in oxy combustion application in industrial energy efficiency, as well as carbon capture from coal-fired power plants, but also biofuel power plants. For example, our sister company, Jupiter Aluminum, has applied oxy combustion for over 20 years very successfully, saving net 50% of the fuel in their aluminum remelt furnaces. One of many energy efficiency success stories. Um, energy efficiency, as we saw from the previous speakers, and renewable energy can do a great deal when it comes to energy uh, in emission reductions. Um, but this is why we have up this graph, the International Energy Agency with their central scenario. They are showing that by 2040, this is primary energy use will be still 75% uh, fossil fuel based. So we want to put our attention in that section. Um, Jupiter Auction has worked uh, over 10 years together with the US Department of Energy 
the National Energy Technology Lab to apply oxy combustion to coal-fired power plants to address those locked-in emissions. And oxy combustion does it actually very successful. It eliminates the nitrogen out of the combustion equation and concentrates the CO2 in the flue gas, in the highly reduced flue gas, so much more cost-effective to capture carbon. Additionally, we do capture and eliminate all the pollutants. We have them available f as a sellable product. We reuse the water from the process. We reuse heat in order to make carbon capture more cost-effectively. Um, in addition, you will need to sell for the first demonstration projects the CO2 in the market, be it enhanced oil recovery or enhanced coal bed methane recovery. So we feel if you have ambitious climate protection goals and the International Energy Agency clearly shows you more ambitious the goals are, the bigger the role of carbon capture will be, you need to focus on that type of technology too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, we have a, a f just literally probably two or three minutes for a few very rapid fire follow up questions, and then I would like to take at least a couple of questions from the audience. Thomas, I wanted to start with you. So, uh, you know, you, you lay out a, a very important um, point. We need to look comprehensively at energy and the components of energy and make sure that we are focusing on solutions and that the business community is contributing solutions to the marketplace that address the comprehensive set of challenges. So for carbon capture, utilization, and storage, where, where can we utilize this technology best? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. So as I mentioned, you need first a cost-effective carbon capture technology and second, a market for the first demonstration projects to sell the CO2. We found those markets in enhanced oil recovery and in enhanced coal bed methane recovery. Just to give you an example, Advanced Resources International's projections for enhanced oil recovery for the US, uh, Mexico, and China, uh, they could use 40 billion tons of CO2. Why is that important for us? With, with that amount of CO2 in the market, uh, you can establish the carbon capture technology to have it available at a lower cost. Uh, enhanced coal bed methane recovery much focused on India and China, currently with two projects moving forward, is in a s similar range. Tens of mil billions of uh, tons of CO2 could be secured, controlled that way. That's the beginning. It builds a bridge, in our opinion, for additional strategies, like we heard also from the biorefineries, where you can start utilize and reuse CO2, hopefully at, la uh, at scale. So there's a lot in perspective what, c what could be done with carbon as a product versus just stored as a waste. Right, and, and you mentioned to me informally that it, China, but there are probably other countries, has uh, carbon capture, utilize, utilization, and storage as part of their NDC, so they are committed to trying to utilize these technologies more. Yes, there was actually a very, very fascinating uh, site event yesterday organized by the NDRC and uh, the Asian Development Bank showing all the development in China, uh, addressing that market. Key driver, you have to say, is the utilization of the CO2 for them, but the effect is that they control a lot of carbon that way. And we have also started with a first uh, uh, commercial scale project in China uh, feasibility study is ongoing, and we expect uh, in April 2018 first results from this retrofit uh, of a 55 megawatt coal fired power plant. We have some costs, projections, then there for that project, and also how to utilize the CO2 in this enhanced coal bed methane recovery market. Great. Well, thank you, um, Jeff, and good to have you. Thank you for for joining the panel. Very quickly, and I, I do, I, I know we went a little longer on that last question, but I do want to get to everybody with at least one more. But you mentioned that Ingersoll Rand, you know, adopted this approach in an uncertain uh, policy environment. How, how is that possible from a, a business standpoint? Oh, well, thanks, Lisa. Again, sorry to be late. Um, as, as, as we developed our sustainability strategy, we knew we had to do something to really transform our business. And so when we made the climate commitment, um, we didn't make it because it was aligned with policy. Um, we made it as something that was transformational for our business. It forced us to do business different than we were doing. And we had to figure out 
how we were going to get there. Once we have that, though, uh, policy can be very helpful for us. And that's why we're in this process, is because we want to create awareness around what we're doing. We want to create awareness around the solutions. And then we want to have policy come in and support what we're doing. And it doesn't just support what we're doing. What it also does is bring along others in our industry so they can start developing similar type new solutions. That's when it really takes off. And so our general approach with sustainability as an integral part of our strategy is to always lead policy. It's a balance. You don't want to get too far ahead of policy. But we always want to lead that. And we always want to be out there with commitments that keep us up at night on how we're going to hit them so it can transform our business. Well, I mean, that's, I think, a big part of what this COP is and certainly what Bingo Day is trying to, to offer. You know, the business community is trying to stretch and, and power increased ambition. And I think all of you have contributed to that. Harry, I, I wanted to ask you something, um, you know, moving away from policy. Again, what can business do on its own? And you mentioned just, just very briefly some new business models you're offering. Can you just speak very briefly about that for us? <clears throat> Yeah, I think we all know how that energy efficiency is the only energy that you don't have to pay for. But in order to unlock uh, the financial benefits, you need some investment in renovating a building or in, in, in including in a better appliance uh, that is usually more innovative, has more tech in it. So what we are doing to actually take away that initial hurdle is creating business models, uh, yeah, not only ESCO-based business models, but also lighting as a service. So where actually our customers, had they, they, there's no need for them to pay for the hardware, but they just pay monthly for the amount of lights that they get. Uh, so we've done it with Schiphol Airport, we've done it with Brownsville, which is a furniture uh, manufacturer in Holland, and it's, it's quickly growing. There's a, there are a lot of projects in the pipeline, because then immediately your monthly expenditure drops. Uh, so it's actually, it's actually efficiency, and in our case, uh, then lighting for free. So it takes away a big, big hurl. Okay. Thank you. Um, look forward to talking to you more about those new trends. And, and John, um, very interesting particular case study that has very significant local economic uh, impacts. But you said briefly that you know this could be any number of technologies. Can you just review for us, kind of wrapping things up here, what are some of the challenges that all technologies have in terms of getting from uh, the the, the output we know they can deliver, but getting to the ground. How do, how do we move from a, pol uh, a technology that offers a clear solution, it, getting it into the marketplace? Um, well, the example, the case study I focused on is because I, th I think the story helps, the details of the story help understand both the opportunity and the challenge. But uh, I have other slides, and they're available at the Business Council's website that show a similar model for uh, solar irrigation, working with smallholders uh, on solar water pumps and the sort of pricing and benefits that come from those, um, working with women's uh, kiosks in Africa, having them offer a slate of products, including LED bulbs uh, and things that are uh, hard to access if you're a poor person in a rural area and, and hard to finance. And so we've tried to set up um, little co-ops are doing that. And, and then we have a program in, uh, in Indonesia at schools where we're trying to get lighting out to families um, through their children in school. So they bring the bulbs in and charge them at the school during the day and, and uh, take them home at night. There's a fee because you have to recover the costs for doing that. But uh, it's a way to sort of not just transform the lighting, but do it in association with education and sort of build community support for the, for the activity. So the challenges across all of these projects are quite similar. You know, one is, is aggregating demand so that you can deliver a quality, reliable, um, privately delivered with profit service so it's sustainable into the future. Um, so being able to aggregate that demand in a meaningful manner uh, and then being able to assure the quality so that you have products that work and you have a way for local, both local buyers, but then more importantly, the third thing is the mobilization of capital, so that you can make lenders uh, confident that their loans will be repaid. Um, that these, uh, there's been 80 of these milk systems installed over the last couple of years. There have been zero 
um, failures uh, to date on that program. And so that helps when you go into a lender and say, well, we've got zero <laughs> default uh, rate for the, for the loan. So those are the, the three critical things. And obviously, um, for any different industry, I mean, we need to have those fundamentals. But I think I've been very impressed with both segments of this discussion, talking at you know kind of the highest level about some of the trends in different technology industry sectors, and then here hearing from the companies and those that are on the ground, uh, working with customers and communities to deploy technologies. Uh, we have a lot to look forward to, but I think as everyone has acknowledged, we have a lot more to do. So I am going to close the panel. I, I think I would rather do that than take a few questions and not really have time in an open setting for us to answer them sufficiently. But I know that we have at least 10 or 15 minutes until the next event, which I'm going to tell you about. And this will keep you here because it's going to be very good. Um, but I'll give you a chance to talk to the panelists, and they, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer your questions. But let me tell you what is coming next. Bingo Day continues. Um, the session number three is climate action and financial institutions mainstreaming the Paris Agreement in the financial sector. It is organized by the Corporación Andean de Formento, CAF, European Investment Bank, and the Institute for Climate Economics. So I want to thank the organizers of this event. I'd like to thank all the panelists. And again, we'll be here if you have specific questions. Appreciate your time and, and your thoughtful uh, consideration of what we had to share. Have a great day.